Hello everyone. In this session, we will talk about the part two of energy production, which is the electron transport chain. And let's look at the first learning outcome, which is the oxidative phosphor relation. So for information, the electron transport chain refers to the structure of proteins by which this chemical reaction of oxidative phosphor relation is happening. So what is oxidative phosphor relation? Well, it refers to the process by which energy from the food oxidation in the forms of high energy electrons are used to generate ATP. And remember, we have captured those high energy electrons in the form of NADH and FADH2. And therefore, you have the flow of electrons from both NADH and FADH2 to oxygen via the electron transport chain, which is a series of proteins that can either accept or donate electrons. So according to the chemical osmotic model, it is from the flow of electrons within this electron transport chain, you have a mechanism to produce ATP. Okay, we are going to elaborate more on this. The oxidative phosphor relation is a redox reaction that occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And the structure that allows this reaction to occur is known as the electron transport chain. It is known as a chain because you get a series of protein complexes, such as complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. So do not really have to memorize their names, but at least you have to know their functions. So for example, complex 1 has the function to receive electrons from NADH, while complex 2 will receive electrons from FADH2, while complex 3 and 4 will receive electrons from the previous complexes. Now, aside from these transmembrane protein complexes, you do have other some smaller mobile electron carriers. So these protein complexes are more or less static because they are transmembrane protein, they cannot move around. But for these coenzyme Q and cytochrome C, these are small mobile electron carriers, they can move around freely in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. But basically, they play similar function, which is to accept the electrons and transport it to the subsequent electron carriers. Well, we need oxygen in the electron transport chain because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And therefore, the oxidative phosphorylation is an aerobic process because it requires the presence of oxygen. And now my question is, how do we make sure that these electrons will flow sequentially from one carrier to another? Well, the answer is, each component in the electron transport chain comes with a specific redox potential or also known as the electron transfer potential. So for a component with a negative redox potential, it means it has a higher tendency to donate its electron as compared to those with a positive values, which means it has a higher tendency to receive the electrons. And therefore, electrons will always flow from the components with a negative redox potential to the other components with a higher redox potential values. As a result, the transfer of electrons is an energetically favored process because both NADH and FADH2 are strong electron donors with a very negative redox potential, while oxygen is a very strong electron acceptor with a very positive redox potential. Now, to make it simple, you can say that oxygen is almost like a magnet pulling electrons along the chain toward itself. But now the question is, how do we make ATP via the flow of electrons? Well, the answer is, this flow of electrons is coupled with the transport of protons across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. In other words, the energy from the flowing electrons are used to pump proton across the inner membrane of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. So this build up a gradient of proton known as the proton modifos. So when these protons re-enter the matrix of the mitochondria via complex 5 or the ATP synthase, this energy is used to synthesize an ATP molecule. Okay, here is where your electron transport chain is located. It is right in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And where is the outer membrane? It is right here on the top. Because it's in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, you will get the 
intermembrane space. So remember, mitochondria is double membrane organelle. While in the middle, you have the mitochondrial matrix, which is consisting of liquid with ions and enzymes required in metabolism, such as the Krebs cycle, which happens right in the matrix. So showing here, you have the components of the electron transport chain. And remember, now NADH is fully charged with the high energy electrons released from the oxidation of acetyl coenzyme A. So these electrons will be passed to first complex number one through coenzyme Q, which is the mobile electron carrier, then to complex number three, then cytochrome C, which is another mobile electron carrier, before passing to complex four and eventually to the oxygen molecule, which is the final electron acceptor. So by receiving the electrons, oxygen is now reduced fully into the water molecule. So here is when you get your first water molecule production in respiration, and that happens right in the electron transport chain. So where is complex two? Well, it is just right here. So complex two will receive specifically electrons from FADH2, and the electrons will flow through similar pathway except that they will bypass complex number one. So here's one important note that all protein complexes except complex two can pump protons across the inner membrane into the intermembrane space. Let me show you a very quick animation. You'll see that it's from the flow of electrons that these protein complexes derive the energy to pump protons across the protein complexes into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. And with that, we have built up a high proton gradient, which can then be used by the ATP synthase to make ATP molecule. And for this reason, you should not understand why NADH can make more ATPs than the FADH2. So one NADH can make up to three ATP, while one FADH2 can only make up to two ATPs. That's because complex two cannot pump any protons across the membrane. But why do you think so? Why do you think so that complex two cannot pump any proton? Well, the answer is complex two is not exactly a transmembrane protein. And therefore, it cannot form a channel or a passage to allow the movement of protons across the inner membrane. So with the pumping of protons, we have now built up a high proton concentration in the intermembrane space, and we call it a high proton motive force. So when these protons flow back into the matrix through the ATP synthase or complex 5, the energy is used to add one phosphate group onto an ADP forming an ATP molecule. So this is an essential part of oxidative phosphorylation. And this model is known as the chemi-osmotic model of ATP synthesis. So again, why do we need oxygen in the electron transport chain? Because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So without this magnet constantly pulling electrons along the series, we can't get the buildup of the proton gradient and subsequently, there will be no ATP production. To put everything into perspective, oxidative phosphorylation is the final process to get ATP production from your glucose molecule. So what's your first step over here? From the conversion of 6-carbon glucose into the 3-carbon pyruvate, you have glycolysis. And then from the pyruvate, you have to be first imported into the matrix of the mitochondria through a transporter protein. But to further oxidize this 3-carbon pyruvate, it will first have to be decarboxylated to produce the 2-carbon acetyl coenzyme A. So one carbon in the form of carbon dioxide is being removed from pyruvate forming the acetyl coenzyme A. Only then, the acetyl coenzyme A can enter the Krebs cycle to form NADH, FADH2, and GTP. So one GTP is equivalent to one ATP because you have the direct transfer of a phosphate group from the GTP to an ADP forming an ATP. And this process is known as the substrate level phosphorylation. While for both FADH2 and NADH, this can then be used in the electron transport chain for the production of many more ATPs. We know that mitochondria contains its own DNA, which is known as the mitochondrial DNA. And sometimes, mitochondrial defects could arise due to the mutations of the mitochondrial DNA 
that is known as mitochondrial defects. One example of mitochondrial defect is the leaky membrane. When you have a leaky membrane, you will get less ATP production. So this partially explains why certain people can eat a lot of food, but they gain weight slowly because they might suffer from a leaky membrane. But for certain people, they gain weight easily as their metabolism is super efficient. And of course, it all depends on your diet and physical activities. So having a healthy lifestyle is always more important. You have learned that oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And by receiving the electron, oxygen itself is fully reduced into what molecule? Well, the answer is water molecule. On the other hand, partial reduction of oxygen can produce reactive oxygen species, ROS, such as the superoxide ions and the peroxide ions. They can cause aging and many other diseases. However, the good news is these superoxide ions and the peroxide ions can be removed by specific enzymes within our cells. But you have to know that ROS is actually a natural side product of metabolism. It happens at all times, but at a very low level. But during times of environmental stress, such as exposure to UV or heat, then ROS levels can increase dramatically. To digress a bit, here is an example of aging caused by UV exposure. So this man has been driving his truck for more than 28 years. And because of the constant exposure to sunlight, one side of his face has so much wrinkles as compared to the other side. Again, this aging process is caused by ROS, which is the reactive oxygen species. So judging from the site of damage, can you predict which country did he come from? Well, the answer is USA, as their driver's side is on the left. Okay, let's do the calculation and sum up the total number of ATP produced per glucose molecule. So in glycolysis, how many ATP do you produce? Well, the answer is two ATP. In fact, we invested two ATP in the glycolysis and then we harvested four ATPs. So the net gain is two ATP per glucose molecule. And we also get two NADH from the glycolysis. But how many ATPs can you get from these two NADH? Well, the answer is either four or six ATPs, which is depending on the type of the shadow system. So here's my question. Where do we convert NADH into ATP? It happens in the mitochondria. But where is glycolysis? It is in the cytoplasm. In other words, we will have to get this NADH from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria co for conversion. And therefore, it depends on the type of shuttle system we are talking about. If we are relying on the glycerol phosphate shuttle system, then one NADH will give only two ATP as it will bypass complex number one. And if you are relying on the second shuttle system, which is malate aspartate shuttle, then they can give three ATP per NADH molecule. However, you don't have to be concerned with the exact number. Just roughly know that these are the figures. Now, in the oxidative decarboxylation, with the two NADH, how many ATP can you get? The answer is always at six ATP because you only rely on the electron transport chain for the production of ATP from NADH. And we know that one NADH is equivalent to three ATPs. So that is done by the oxidative phosphorylation. While in your Krebs cycle, you, have, you get two GDP, which is equal to two ATP by direct transfer of phosphate group. While again, six NADH times three gives you 18. Two FADH2 will give you two times two equal to four ATPs. Again, these two are by the oxidative phosphorylation process. And with that, you'll get a total of either 36 or 38 ATPs just from one glucose molecule. So you don't really have to know all these details. It is just for your reference.